Hi everybody, my name is Jesse Hattishell. I work for Ada County Sheriff's Office. I'm the probation supervisor. Uh, so thank you guys for having us today. Uh, probation and parole, uh, Betsy Owens, she's their lead probation officer. She was supposed to assist me today, uh, but unfortunately uh, she came down with uh, some illness and she wasn't able to make it. So I won't be able to completely help you with all of probation and parole, like procedural there, uh, specifically their uh, procedural questions, things like that, but we can uh, jot those down and get you some answers if you have that. But any other questions that you may have as far as uh, uh, Ada County goes, as far as the Sheriff's Office, I'd be happy to answer those at the end. So what about, what is probation? Probation is once uh, a person has gone through the court process that's been explained to everybody today, uh, they've gone through the arrest, they've gone through the court process, they've been found guilty or pleaded guilty of a crime, <clears throat> then they're sentenced to a, a period of jail time and potentially a fine. They're, they've been given some type of punishment. Now, at the misdemeanor level, as was explained uh, by Scott Bandy, um, at the misdemeanor level, at, my, at our level, it's a sentence of jail time. They can't go to prison. So that's not going to exceed one year in the county jail. Um, and then what the court does is in order to not go to jail for that year, then they suspend that time and give them a period of probation, typically one to two years. Um, and then they come to us. They say, if you don't want to go to jail and you don't want to pay this fine, then you're going to follow these rules. Okay, because what we're ultimately looking for is whatever behavior that brought you into the criminal justice system, that's what we want to change. Um, and they uh, put you, and our authority, but let's back up, our authority comes directly um, under the purview of the court. We are officers of the court. Um, this, uh, the conditions of the sentence can always vary, uh, but this can include things like jail time, fines and fees, restitution, payments, treatment, counseling, urinalysis testing, these things may vary, hair follicles, um, child protection plans, working with case managers, health and welfare, um, and, and medication management, the things can vary of what the courts want them to do. But ultimately, it keeps them out of custody uh, for many reasons. Number one, that's not pro-social. Number two, it's very expensive. Number three, most of us here live in Ada County, maybe, right? And it's ex we're taxpayers, right? I, I don't know what the average cost, uh, maybe, uh, Lieutenant DeRozier talked about the cost of housing somebody. I, unfortunately, I wasn't here for that presentation, but it's expensive to taxpayers. So you want to keep the people that don't need to be in jail, not these people that aren't bad people, that may have made a mistake. We want to keep them out, provide them resources and get them out of the system. Now, the difference between felony and misdemeanor was already discussed, so we're not going to really beat up on that too, too much. Um, that was discussed by um, the, the PA's office. <clears throat> but we understand that the severity is much worse with the felony. Um, and you're looking at much signif more, more significant sentences up to life in prison. Misdemeanors, which is our area, are less serious crimes, such as DUIs, non-injury crimes, domestic violence offenses that don't involve serious traumatic injuries, petty thefts, possession of marijuana in the state of Idaho. Um, they, and again, we talked a little bit about the severity of the sentences. Um, Ada County Probation Services, that which we refer to as ACAMP, operates under the umbrella of the sheriff's office. Now in the state of Idaho, it's actually Idaho state code that each county is responsible for providing misdemeanor probation services. Now this is varies over the, the United States of America. Some states like California, Oregon, and the state of Washington don't even have misdemeanor probation services at all. And so it becomes unique when we say we have to transfer uh, our, our misdemeanor cases to those states. So people that are say get arrested for a DUI second offense, the United States, the federal government, requires that they are supervised if they live in another state. So if we have to they get a DUI second in Idaho, we transfer them to Washington State, they're supervised by felony probation and parole. So it's a unique circumstance that they place themselves in. But in Idaho, each state is required under Idaho code to provide misdemeanor probation services. And they can do that two ways. One, either they can be provided under um, the, the, the Board of County Commissioners, and they, they make sure that, that they independently run, or you can be cross-deputized by the sheriff's office. The unique thing about Ada County is we are the only agency in the state of Idaho, or the only county in the state of Idaho, that utilizes this method of supervision, being cross-deputized. Um, and the felony probation is operated, obviously, under the Department of Corrections. Now, what is the difference between probation and parole? Probation is you get sentenced at court, and then your sentence is suspended, and then you are placed onto supervision. Now, individuals that are placed on to parole means that they are sentenced to a period of prison time, okay? 
If you are on misdemeanor probation, you have no chance of doing any type of parole. It does not exist in my world. Now, in probation and parole's world, clearly it's in the name. That's where that lives. So if you are convicted of a felony, that is the only way you are, would ever be eligible for parole. Now, parole is felony supervision where these individuals have been served a period or portion, say they're given a five-year uh, prison sentence, say they serve three years and they're eligible for parole. Then they'll go in front of the, the board of uh, parole commission, will say, okay, we'll give you a chance, and they'll release them on parole to the supervision conditions. But see, they don't have to go back in front of a judge. That same parole commission, if they don't follow the rules of their parole, can bring them back in front of the parole commission and put, return them to prison if they're not compliant with their conditions. Well, what's our role? How do we play, fit in? Is our role to be enforcement heavy, track these people down, and just look for them to, look for them to do things that are wrong? Are we looking for them to fail? Absolutely not. In fact, we preach a culture where we're looking to find these people doing things right. Our job is to not find ways to put people in jail. In fact, it's the opposite. Our job is to find ways to keep people out. Our job is to pr promote pro-social behaviors and provide people with resources to keep them out of the system, okay? In fact, we use evidence-based principles. We promote evidence-based principles, and, and we actually learned that there's data that proves that if we over-supervise low-risk people, if we put them, put, place them with people that are high criminal risk individuals, we're actually doing more harm than good. Those people are more likely to reoffend, to integrate themselves in criminal conduct than if we were to just leave these people alone. Because isn't it safe to say that all of us make mistakes, all of us do bad things, but most of us are responsible and we self-correct? Well, that is the same for a lot of the individuals that even come through our doors and even through probation and parole's doors. The unique caveat to misdemeanor probation, though, is, and which is why I've stayed in this business for as long as I have, and I've had no desire to go to probation and parole, and this is no disrespect to them because they do wonderful work, is because we have a unique opportunity to put a stop to that person taking that next step to the more extreme uh, felony level, which will drastically change their lives and opportunities that they have for their future. But our, our job is to get them out of the system. We monitor compliance of court orders. We monitor their supervision agreement. So like we said, the judge says, okay, you don't have to go to jail, but you're gonna do all these things. You're gonna check in with probation. The three rules to probation are very simple. Don't drink alcohol, don't use illegal drugs, don't break the law. Those are the three pivotal rules of probation. Then there's other things like checking in with probation, get a job if you're eligible, you know, you know, don't, don't get, hang or associate with other people that are getting into trouble. You know, if you have a substance use disorder issue, if you have mental health issues, if you are experiencing a mental health crisis, if you need medication management, we'll help you navigate those things. We've worked with, we saw uh, MCU is here. Uh, we work with CIT. We have CIT in the sheriff's office. Uh, we have compliance deputies that are literally in the next office over from me that are trained to help us in these situations. As you can see, Unfortunately, they were stuck using a picture of me, um, but the, the, we actually go out with our deputies into the field so that we have these resources with us in the event that we have to take action, we have the ability to do so. We have so many resources to help individuals. And again, this deputy is not here to, hopefully we find something and can arrest this person. They're just there for our security, number one. And number two, they're trained, like, uh, like Deputy Levis said, she took the 40 hour CIT course, and she is an action deputy. She's not a CIT deputy. Um, they still have this advanced training so they can determine if a person needs that extra help to get them to a hospital instead of jail, then that's what we have the ability to do so that they can get the actual help that they need. Uh, we promote re reduction of criminal behavior. We do that by their contacts. We do that through classes. We do that through treatment. We do that through cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we coordinate drug, drug and alcohol testing. Obviously, if these, they're ingesting illicit substances, this isn't good. And so we monitor that uh, by putting them in, in uh, through drug and alcohol testing. Uh, connects their clients and families with resources, conducts office visits, home and employment checks, 
And then we provide the court and or the commission of uh, pro, uh, parole with updated reports. Um, unique to the um, misdemeanor side of things and to uh, the, the felony side of things are the specialty courts or domestic violence court, mental health court, drug court, um, veterans court. These are all accelerated programs that are incentivized to provide a multitude of opportunities for these ones, these unique categories of individuals so that they have specialized treatment for these high risk categories to get them through the program and, uh, and, and with, with a withheld judgment, which is the closest thing to an expungement in Idaho, and then get them through the program so that they can kind of ha say they can wash their hands and have a clean record. So what is a misdemeanor probation officer's scope and authority? Um, it's important to know that a lot of times people will call um, either their, their probate misdemeanor or felony PO and, and think, say, hey, my son's high or my, my daughter's drunk or my husband or whatever, I want them out, I want them in jail. It's important to understand that we have limited peace officer authority, both at the misdemeanor and felony level. Um, the statute that allows us that, that authority as misdemeanor POs is under 2227 in Idaho code, which is the felony peace, uh, or the, the felony uh, pr probation parole officer statute. So we have that limited peace officer, which does not mean that we are first responders. So we don't have the blue lights red lights and sirens on our vehicles. We can't pull people over. We do not have that authority the same as a police officer would do. In the event that you are needing that, we would encourage you to utilize non-emergency dispatch if it's a non-emergency, 911 if it is, and call the police. And then we can coordinate there afterwards. Misdemeanor POs have limited availability to um, respond to these public safety threats. We have the issue to authority, uh, to issue sanctions for a violation that has been committed, but not in real time. Uh, we have some availabilities to us, uh, but it's not, uh, not 24 hours a day. And that's simply just because of staffing. <clears throat> in a perfect world, we wish we could stay up with the infrastructure of the area and how fast it's growing, but we're a government agency and with funding and everything else, as most of you know, that comes with time. And it's something where we know there's a need for and we're working on drastically to drastically improve that level of service. Because although this is something that we know we need to provide for the community, we also wanna provide a high level of service to those people we're serving, which is also the offender, the probationer. We wanna provide a high level of service to them as well. So again, the, we can't stress enough that if you are in contact with individuals that, have in, that are in fear or of another probationer, the probation officer probably isn't the immediate person to call if there's an imminent threat or risk. 911 for first responders is who you want to call. Now, the felony probation officer's scope and authority, um, so they have the same scope and authority of, over anybody under felony supervision. Um, that peace officer status in front of law enforcement presence, kind of the same thing we already talked about. Now, what do we expect when we're communicating with our individuals? They're expected to meet with us regularly. That varies on risk, the, the person's risk level. When we first meet with these folks, we, that's the first thing we do is conduct a risk assessment. In Idaho, both for felony and misdemeanor, we use a, a risk assessment called the LSI. And what that does is we look at these different categories of criminogenic risks and individual needs. And that's anything from financial to substance use to um, contacts, to relationships, to, I mean, it's a broad spectrum of things. And we could say, okay, this area is not a concern. This area is a big concern. This area is not a big concern. Now we can focus our attention on the things this person needs and leave them alone and the things they don't need to get them the resources. Now, if a person's low risk, we leave them alone. Uh, the contacts are minimal. We might see them once every 30 to 60 days, might be by phone, uh, might be by email, but we're still maintaining contact. Now, if an individual's high risk, uh, we're trying to have two to four contacts with them a month. And that's either in the office, by phone, in the field, at their home, at their employment, and we're trying to make sure that they're staying on, on track. Um, felony POs schedule monthly meetings to discuss their prog uh, progress. I know that we have what's called ASU, which is Altern Al Alternate Supervision Unit. That's our, lo well, our low risk unit and felony has what they call LSU, which is low, low supervision unit. 
And I know that those contacts with them can range up to months before they have contact with their checking with their PO, but I don't want to speak to exact timelines because I, I don't know. That'd be a better question for them. Um, preferred communication with a pro any probation officer is by email. Why that's so important? It's written. Anything in the court system, the best thing to remember is if it wasn't written down, it never happened. So we preferred that because not only does it allow the individual to, to hold the individual accountable, but it also holds the probation officer accountable. As we said, everybody makes mistakes. If it's in writing, we can hold each other accountable. So if it ever has to come back up in court, we have a written documentation. And then always make sure you're communicating important steps of the probation, any changes of information in a timely manner. Now what happens at the visits? Most interactions um, are at the office due to safety, okay? Especially at the, at the misdemeanor level, we always have um, commissioned deputies, uh, the guys, guys with the guns, and they have the tools for public safety, they're there. Because at misdemeanor level, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, our probation officers are unarmed. Um, and we're, we're that for a reason, for a number of different philosophy reasons. Um, and felony probations uh, have different interactions, both in the field um, and in the field and in the office, but they are armed. And again, for other philosophy reasons and because of the risk level. Um, they're dealing with, they have much, I don't want to say a much higher propensity for violence because we deal with a lot of the same individuals, but the risk is greater. These people, the other people all, all have been convicted of felonies where we're dealing with a lot more misdemeanors, but it's by a case by case basis. And when we do conduct the meetings, we wanna get real information. And we're not checking boxes. We use different communication styles, things like motivational interviewing where we ask open-ended questions because that's, we're really trying to find that individual's intrinsic motivation to see what, how we're gonna affect their behavior change. Um, we can check boxes and say, do you get your community service done? Check. Doing your drug test? Check. All right, see you in a month. I mean, that's we're really not affecting change, right? They, anybody can fake it till you make it for that period of time but we really want to see what's going on in their life. We really want to see what they're doing that's helping them get through the process that's going to, once they're done with us, that's going to make them not come back into the system. Uh, we want to, we have to, yes, we have to check those boxes and see what's going on. And then we also have to see if they're not complying. We have to be balanced. And if they're not complying, we also have to be the enforcer. We have to give some kind of sanction when we try to use graduated sanction for non-compliance. That can be anything from, hey, you, you use marijuana or you use meth or you drank alcohol. You're gonna, we're gonna increase your urinalysis testing now to six times a month because of your poor choices. And if there's any further uh, you know, positive tests, then we're going to sanction you to an ankle monitor or you're gonna do a weekend in jail or it can be a number of different things. But we try to use the least restricted alternative to give them an opportunity to correct the poor choice. Um, we also want to give them incentives. If you do well, we'll take you off testing. If you do well, we'll let the judge know at your next review or uh, one of those things. And then if they need help, ask them. Um, if you need help, we're, we're here. We have pretty good resources and then we uh, let them go to the community and get them the help they need. Um, a little bit about us. Uh, we dress uh, business casual at misdemeanor um, for office meetings and then we do have a soft uniform. We don't dress in the sheriff's uniform. Um, because we do want to know that there is a difference between a sheriff's deputy and a probation officer. Um, it's just, we want the, to know that there's a difference there. Um, we wear black uniforms that say probation with a khaki pants. Um, this, in this picture, they don't have them. We are going to duty belts, but we do not carry firearms. Um, and then probation and parole also wear, um, I thought they had a picture on there. Probation and parole wear similar uniforms except it says parole agent on the back they were an over vest with parole uh, parole um, badge on the front and then they do wear duty belts and carry firearms and we go with deputies they usually take a partner when they um, conduct field visits but they do they call for assist from law enforcement agencies when new crimes happen and things like that now it's important to understand i know that uh, scott from the PA's office and um, Danica both talked about confidentiality and how that's important and attorney client privilege. Well, we also need to respect confidentiality. And um, we're not also, uh, Danica gave a good example of a mom wanting to know, wanting to know information about a son's crime. 
we can acknowledge an individual, it's public information. You can look on the internet and know that somebody was sentenced to a crime and placed on probation. So yes, we can acknowledge that a person is placed on probation and we can acknowledge that I or whomever is their probation officer. Beyond that, we cannot talk about the case. We cannot give out information unless that person has signed a release of information and allowed us to talk with that individual um, or the courts have released that information. Now, usually the courts will allow us to talk to treatment providers, drug testing, the court, and so on, so that we can share that information and get updates so that we know they're complying with the, the terms of their probation. Um, we do receive, uh, we receive a lot of information from the public, um, especially people that are very concerned for individuals that are involved in criminal activity or criminal behavior. A lot of these ones are, are loved ones that are just seeing their, their, their loved one go down a wrong path and they want to help. And it's hard because they don't want to feel like they're telling on them because they know there's potentially a consequence, but they know that if they don't, the consequences of not speaking up might potentially uh, be a far worse outcome. And so they reach out and we can absolutely collect that information. And our procedure, it's not policy, but it is procedure for RPOs is that they look into every allegation that comes into the office, office, whether it be egregious or not. Um, we are going to look into every accusation that comes into the office. It is going to be investigated and vetted, um, and we are going to call that individual in. Um, and then once that, if that individual asks to remain anonymous, then we don't obviously disclose who called that information in. They do not have a right to know um, who called that information into us. Now, re rehabilitation versus arrest. A probation officer is, has to be very balanced here. Um, I lateraled from Twin Falls County in 2015, and I will tell you up front, I had a lot of adjusting to do when I came to the sheriff's office. And uh, Lieutenant DeRozier was my sergeant at the time, um, and he can tell you I had a lot of adjusting to do. I, we were very, very, very enforcement heavy there. Very enforcement heavy. We did a lot of arresting, a lot of new charges, I mean, we, I, we, I still feel we helped a lot of people, but the focus was a lot of finding people doing things wrong. And I know them. I love that team there still. A lot of that has changed over the years, and I think a lot of this business has changed over the years. But really the focus now is on rehabilitation, that public service, okay, customer service. Um, but you have to be balanced. A good probation officer is half cop, half social worker, okay? You have to be right in the middle. You have to be willing to, to show that you, you want to, to work with this person. I'm not suggesting that our law enforcement officers don't do this. They do an excellent job of it. In fact, um, it was uh, uh, Officer Hovarth, I believe she said, most of what they do is talk. If you can't communicate with the public, you're not gonna last as a police officer. And that's what we have to do. But providing those resources to the individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis is what we have to do. But on the other side, we have to be willing to enforce court orders. And the, the, the thing that we have to do as well as probation officers is we have to be willing to, it's easy when it's a, it's a warrant. You, you didn't write the warrant, the judge signed the warrant. You're just enforcing the warrant by arresting somebody, right? I didn't do it, it's the judge's call. But when you have an individual sitting in front of you and you have to make that decision You've given this person an opportunity to change, they refuse to change, and I have to act. It's on me to act now, but it's my choice. And they're, they're begging you to not put them in jail, but something has to happen. You have to make the decision and have the courage to do so. Can you make that decision and enforce the court order? So it's a tough choice to make sometimes, and that's why it's a hard job. It's a stressful job. Uh, but we have to enforce court orders when we, when we need to. We also have to show dignity, respect, and compassion, empathy uh, when we have the ability to. So we want to enhance the client's success through transitional housing, drug testing, treatment, appropriate fa family conduct, intermediate sanctions, and accountability for maladaptive behaviors, which can result in, in an arrest. And, and I, I'm not trying to patronize anybody by that, but maladaptive behaviors is primarily what we want to attack. The maladaptive behaviors are, are things that that we want to focus on and, and, and target because it's, they're doing it because they can get away with it. They know it's wrong, but they're doing, it's the, those behaviors. It's not the, the activity itself, it's the behavior behind the activity. We wanna target that. And then we wanna want them to tell us or what motivates them to tell us how they're going to change. 
So when people don't want to do that, then obviously it leads, uh, they give us little other choice than, uh, than punishment. But ultimately that comes down to the judge's decision. So again, we talked a little bit about this full-time employment, stable residence, no drinking, no drugs, no association with felons without permission from PO. Um, this is more of a PMP rule. We don't have a, a standard condition of not associating, associating with felons. Although we do have a standard condition with misdemeanor, uh, follow any lawful direction given to you by your PO. We can enforce any rule, lawful direction, uh, that is a detriment to your success on probation. So if you're associating with people that aren't good people, we can stop that. Um, no weapons, ammo, knives. Again, for misdemeanor probation, only certain offenses that we can enforce this on. If your Second Amendment rights are intact, then uh, that's something we can't touch. Um, and then uh, participate in, in any programming that's ordered. Uh, curfew, uh, at the misdemeanor level, we don't enforce these. It's very, very rare. Uh, like uh, was talked about by Scott, there are very few juveniles that are sentenced to adult crimes. Um, sometimes we'll enforce, enforce curfews on those, but it is very common on felony probation. Daily reporting, again, a felony thing. A discretionary jail time. This is time that the, the courts have imposed, but held in abeyance, and given to the probation officer to use at their discretion. So we don't need to go see a judge to impose this time. So that would be one of those penalties or punishments for, say, a dirty UA or one of those sanctions that we would use. Um, we can only use up to two, two to three days at a time uh, without a judicial oversight. Uh, so that it used to be before 2016, if the judge gave us 90 days, bam, you were, we could put you in for 90 days if we needed to. Not that we would see that very often, but after the Supreme Court made a, an adjustment to that criminal rule and limited that to two to three days. Um, interlock devices in the cars for DUIs. To, to their, uh, their cars can't start if they've been consuming any amount of alcohol. GPSs on their ankles or sober links um, is another ankle monitor that they can put on that can read transdermal alcohol concentration that comes out of their skin. No contact orders, protection orders. Uh, this protects uh, victims. We do take those very, very seriously. Um, and, and helps family members feel safe while these individuals don't have to be in jail and can remain in the public and then get their lives back on track while the victims can still feel safe and we keep an eye on them. And then also transitional housing. And transitional housing are for these ones that maybe suffer from substance use disorder and are trying to get out of jail, back into the community, back into the workforce, still dealing with substance use issues and getting the treatment they need, but in a so sober living environment. And so, and around sober, sober support system. So here's a little bit, of, if you guys need to find us in the community, we're at, at the sheriff's office, so right off the connector, you see the big jail. We're at the furthest southeast corner of that, 7180 Barrister, entrance four. Um, our office hours are seven to seven. Um, as of the 28th, we are actually going seven to five. Um, and that, that was actually just announced earlier today at the, the meeting I was at. Um, so we will be open 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And that may change in the future as we grow in staff. It's just as for staffing right now, I just don't have enough people. Um, and so we're working on, on improving that for the future. Um, and then uh, as we mentioned earlier, most meetings are scheduled on a monthly basis. Um, in my office, I have 11 probation officers. I have 10 female officers, one male officer. Um, I am the supervisor and I have one manager, Carrie Anderson. Um, I have four techs uh, assistants. We're going to ask for more because um, I have 1,400 active, a little over 1,400 active probationers right now. And, but we still have about 1,700 cases or a little over 1,700 cases that we track. Um, and that includes people that absconded supervision. They took off. We don't know where they're at or they're out of county or we sent them out of state or they're coming in state. So we still have to track these cases or they've expired, but they're pending a probation violation. We still have to go to court on them. So we still have over 1,700 cases active. I have four people, three of which have to handle all the phone calls. One works the front desk. So it's, it's a lot of work for that few people, and we try to make it work. Uh, we try to utilize our resources to the best of our efforts. Um, the most you can charge for probation in the state of Idaho is $75 for felony or misdemeanor. Um, cost of supervision, for court fines, fees, restitution, they can be paid at the probation office. It all goes back to the Supreme Court. Um, so people say, well, I wanna pay my COS, but I wanna pay my fines. It doesn't matter. It all is one account that's connected to your case number, all goes back to the Supreme Court and they divvy it up however it gets divvied up. We don't, it, we, but you can pay it at the probation office if you needed to. 
Um, online payments can be paid with credit card, or debit card, uh, but you are also charged a transaction fee if you do that. Um, if you ever need to check in with probation, you can schedule your meeting in person or by phone. You're provided a business card with your pro probation officer's phone number and email address. And you can, um, and again, we suggest strongly, strongly recommend that if, again, obviously if there's language barriers or, or things like that, it may be difficult to email, but that's always the recommended method of contacting us and to get the fastest response. A felony probation, uh, this is where they're at, the, the Region 4 office, the, their Emerald office anyway. And I, they, I know they have several satellite off offices around the valley in CUNA, Eagle, um, and at Mark Stahl, Boise Police Department. Um, a little bit about them, if they can't get there, I know they have a duty officer uh, on, so this is eventually what we're going to try to, to work towards. Uh, misdemeanor is relatively young. We've only been, this is actually our 10th year uh, since the sheriff, sheriff's office took over um, from a private contract. Sheriff's office took over the contract in 2012. So we're still growing to get to that point to where we can hopefully have a duty officer, an on-call officer to provide these resources around the clock like felony set up to do. The difference is I have 11 POs, they have 70. So that's the difference between probation and parole and us. So just, <laughs> they, they, uh, we'd like to get there at some point. Um, so they always have a duty officer available if you can't reach your PO. So 70 felony POs based at the Emerald location and an additional 10, so this is just in region four. So just here in Ada County, so we have 80 at CUNA, Eagle, Boise, Ada County Jail, Garden City, yeah. Um, and then you can pay your CO, it gives you some information on how to pay your COS. And I just keep, if you need more time to write it down, just let me know. And Okay, and we've talked a lot about the non-English language access. For us, interpreters will always be provided during your probation meetings at no cost to you. We pay for the, the uh, we pay those expenses uh, through Ada County Misdemeanor Probation. Uh, we, the probation officer is the responsible party for, for scheduling the interpreter. Uh, it's in, it's, we, we prefer that we get an in-person interpreter, but that's not always the case depending on the language. Um, like Santiago was saying earlier, sometimes that's not available because some of these really rare languages are popping up and sometimes they have to be scheduled by phone uh, and availability. Um, and then these are paid by, we actually have a budget line for interpreter services. So those costs are taken care of. So again, customer service, service forward, we can take care of these individuals. Um, felony PO modifications to a court order can be made so that these things are, are uh, it can be adjusted to overcome these, these language barriers and, and accommodations can be made um, and if they're requested. Um, sometimes things happen and scheduling falls through, interpreters don't show up um, and they can use family members to help them with interpretation, but we do see that there are some issues that, that can come up when a family member does try to do uh, help with interpretation. Um, and another, and if, a, if the, the if the individual doesn't report for their meeting, we, the, as far as I can't speak for felony, but ACAMP is responsible financially for the cost of the interpreter, even if the individual doesn't show up for the meeting. Um, this is a federal requirement that we do uh, provide these resources. Um, and then also for treatment needs. There are, this has been a challenge and we've worked through this. I, I was promoted to, uh, the lead position in 2017 or 2018. Um, and this was kind of a, pro, pro, a process for us to get this going to find uh, interpreters that were willing to work with the treatment providers. But once we help them understand this is a federal law requiring to provide you, that you have to do this to help them out, that they've really jumped on board and it's really been successful in getting these folks the help they need in the language that they can understand. So it's truly meaningful for them for their their success and their future of getting out of the criminal justice system so how can you support somebody on probation communicate with them um, you can talk to the po you can ask questions if you're their support system and you're trying to help them understand the process and maybe you're trying to help them navigate or you can help uh, communicate with them in a more effective way talk to the po just say, hey, help me understand so I can help them. Please do that. Be open and honest. If you think they're struggling in an area, 
because I don't know, and I can't speak for probation and parole, but they run a pretty tight shop. I can speak for my folks. We, I, I promise you, I run a pretty tight shop. We want these people to succeed. And, and our, our POs want to help these individuals. We're not looking for them to fail. And so if there's things that can help, and we're not looking to put, just put people in jail. We're looking to keep them out, like we discussed earlier. Uh, please encourage them to, to follow the rules. We will hold them accountable. Please keep them connected with resources and understand that if they're struggling, come to us. That's why that we're here. Um, we deal with people with substance use issues. We deal with people with anger issues. We deal with people that are vulnerable. Um, send them to us so that we can pro connect them with community uh, resources. And then uh, continue education. Attend trainings like this. Attend trainings and other opportunities to get to know what's out there and what's available. So with that, hopefully that was fast enough. Sorry. And I know you guys are tired, but I'm happy to open it up for any questions. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. We have a virtual question and then I'm going to go over here. So Jesse, we have a question from the online chat is what is the caseload like for a probation officer currently? For misdemeanor? Okay. So for active probationers, we actually, luck, lucky for the online chat, we just had the BOCC quarterly last week. So um, right now currently for active. So this is that uh, about 1,400 active, so we're about one in 134. So we have about, about 134 uh, active probationers per every PO, and that's general caseload. Keep in consideration that both my manager and myself carry a caseload because of when the numbers were taken, we were sh short-staffed, and so I, at that time I had about 71, and I believe she had about 67. And so that's gonna drop that average a little bit. So the average PO general caseload is about 150, and that's historically lower than we've been in a very, very long time. Um, as far as felony goes, they have specialized caseloads. I really can't speak to that, but it, it is lower. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, how do you work with the non-English when you're um, talking about transitional homes and, and different cultures in those homes? So, the, great question. Um, in the transitional housing, that's, that would be unique because I haven't personally run into that situation myself. And I would have to probably rely on, probably have to ask Jessica, if, I, I would start phoning a friend in that situation and be like, are you aware of any of these? Is there anything set up right now? Um, and start try to, to pull resources to see if there's anything available. And then not only that, but we, we have what's called the CTC, the Community Transition Center. Um, and that, that reintegration program into the community uh, through the, the, um, that we have there, there's a whole program. I would st probably start utilizing those folks too. So if this person is going to be going back into the public and, and start doing probation, we'd probably start that route and see if, if there was something available and if not, find an alternative for that person. Do you have any other questions? They're like, no way. I have one. Yeah. So if somebody is like a case manager, peer support specialist, or just community advocate for somebody who's on probation, what's the best way when they reach out to you guys of identifying themselves as someone who can help? Like, what do you want to hear to be like, okay, now I understand who you are. So now I'm more willing to share with you some help steps for ma help making them successful. Yeah. So if, if you guys ever have information for us, yeah, just, it, it, just that be, be open with us says, this is who I am. This is who I know. I'm trying to help them with this thing. And the more information you can give us up front, uh, the more we'll be like, yeah, absolutely. Because that, that's ultimately what we want to do is if you're a resource for the individual, that's our job. And a lot of the times, if, especially with case managers, we, you know, especially if we, we're dealing with 150 people and a case manager has 10 or 20 or 30, you're going to be more, you know, you're going to have that better rapport with the individual. So we're relying on you for information and say, hey, can you help me? Because we do have that arm of the court. We have that, that, that enforcement side of probation to hopefully help motivate that individual, maybe through some of those sanctions, uh, graduated sanctions, if they don't start doing the things that you're asking them to do engage in. 
And so we can work with each other, collaborate with each other to get the person to move in a positive direction. I'm not sure quite how to say this, but um, I think I've heard just kind of out and about that uh, probationers and parolees, like they're, um, they're not supposed to really associate or live with one another unless they're family. Um, and again, I might be completely wrong on that. Uh, so what kind of happens with uh, like Boise in the current housing crisis and like people losing their homes um, and then maybe wanting to move in with like a friend who's also a probationer or parolee? That's a great question. That, that would be a case by case basis. Um, we, we have had that come up in the past. And, and again, so I know the rule with probation and parole. And so when, when we do have that, say we have a uh, husband and wife and we, this uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, say we have brothers, siblings, say we have friends. Um, they're, one's on probation, one's on parole, one's on felony probation, one's on misdemeanor probation. Hey, we were roommates. We both got sentenced at the same time. One catches a new charge, something like that. They just need to talk to us. All right, if they're both, depends on their behavior mostly. If they're, one's behaving poorly and doing bad things, it's my job to keep the other one from engaging in that same poor behavior. So I'm gonna do my job and say, all right, you can't associate with that individual or it's his PO's or her PO's job to remove that individual from engaging with my probationer to keep him from re-engaging um, in that criminal conduct. And so even, it's a case by case basis. Now, if both individuals are doing well, then there's a good chance that we're probably gonna let them cohabitate um, or live in the same house because they're not doing anything wrong. They're both engaged in pro-social conduct. And so they would have to give us a reason to make them move. I mean, we're, we're not, we, if they're doing well, why would we displace them? And you know, we, we don't wanna set them up for failure. But traditionally, no. Two felons, we don't want them associating with other felons because they're likely to do bad things. Um, or, but misdemeanor probationers, there's no rule unless they give us a rule. It's not a standard term of probation to not be able to live with another probationer. Great. Do you have any other questions? Oh, one more. Jesse, did you say it was $75 a month for probation? Correct. What if somebody's indigent and they can't pay? They're trying, they're, they're following everything, but they don't have that $75. What happens then? Okay, so great question there too, thank you. Um, so what we've done as, uh, again, we're a contract, so we have what's called an MOU, which is an agreement with the county that allows us to function. Uh, so what we asked was based on that specific, um, it, because we do, we de de deal with an, people that uh, suffer with the indigent population. We have to go back and ask the court for either a reduction or a waiver of the cost of supervision um, because it's not based on their financial circumstances, it's based on them being successful. And we, we ask the judge, we go on a sliding fee scale. I review those based on their income and their ability to pay. And then I go off of a, uh, the federal poverty guidelines and based on a sliding fee scale, I see what they qualify to pay and then we send a, a, uh, a motion to the court and the judge can either approve it or deny it. And I have never, I've only had the district court deny it because it's not the way felony uh, does it, but that's just because they're not used to the magistrate process that we've done. Um, but the, the magistrates, I've never had a magistrate deny one of those. Um, and then some cases, especially those that are gravely mentally ill, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the government to pay the government and thus to provide services. And typically we'll just do uh, full fee waivers, which we can do at our discretion. Um, and then, um, but that has to still ha all have to be signed off by the court. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.